you got a better this or that that you can beat up the other people with or poison them with or whatever you're planning on doing. Um, but it, but it, but it, it's, uh, you know, it, it just, it's sort of, it just, it becomes the structures that we inhabit. Uh, and so that is a very large order to try and all fit into one lecture, needless to say. And since I'm a world historian, we're going to have to go way back in time too, because otherwise we can't understand it, of course. And so, um, that's also an element in, in our story. And then I just know too much and I know it in the wrong way. <laughs> All right. And the wrong way is not, I do know it in the world history way and the world history way will pull us through. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. And, and I do really want you to say, if you're losing me, for God's sake, speak up because this is your chance. Um, this is a, this is sort of a half-baked, um, item it's not been fully roasted and toasted and so um, it'll be better some other time possibly next time will be next fall sure. and maybe we'll plunge back into the into the military toolkit one more time because it does take a lot of attention all right so let's just get started here and i wanted to launch us by having us look at the mid-arid zone because the thing I wanted to put in front of your consciousness again and, uh, is, the, is the idea that this interconnecting uh, series of, let's call them continents and subcontinents and kind of continents and sort of would have been continents, all of those things that are part of the great Afro-Eurasian landmass um, are, uh, are split down the middle, as you can see where the green is and where the, where the uh, paler colors are. Uh, in something that uh, some historians and geographers call the mid-arid zone. So the mid-arid zone indeed, I think, goes around the world, but this is this is the bit that we want to talk about now because it's the interacting societies of the mid-arid zone that are the ones that we need to focus on. And, the, and the, so, um, so it goes all the way from the frontiers of China, all the way across through the Middle East and the Sahara Desert and all the way to um, to, to um, the Atlantic Ocean. So that's a very large space, it's space and it's an interactive zone. So that means that um, the, the peoples involved in it are on a sort of a bush tele telephone kind of situation in which they can kind of sort of hear things if you, if you hum a few bars and fake it a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and so stuff that's invented in one place transits all the way across, right? So that's so, I mean, one one little, this is a little toolkit idea that I, I didn't quite ever know what to do with. It doesn't belong in this lecture, but but <laughs> but uh, but it's a, that, that's probably not the only thing that's going to crop up that will be in that category. But um, but in any event, uh, the the currency that is widely used in across Africa and uh, and, and involved in, uh, in in exchanges of all kinds has to do with a particular kind of cowrie shell that comes from the Indian Ocean world. How does that cowrie shell get to um, the middle of the Sahara, right? So there's a whole trade network that brings it. And, and the reason it's there and the reason it's a currency is because it's not found. It's rare, therefore you, you, can, you, you can invest in it value, right? So it's like the dollar bill, which is just a piece of paper. Right, so why not have a cowrie shell? We could put somebody's picture on it, maybe it's better. Who, um, who knows? All right, so so mid-arid zone then is the is the area that we're going to be uh, tramping around in, and it's an area in in which um, that there are three different kinds of people, and uh, and I'm going to talk about them in, in a greater detail in a minute or two. But first, I want to get us launched by thinking about the military toolkit, which is indeed the reason we're here because it's part of this larger different kind of an approach to world history that I've been trying to uh, encourage you to begin to think about. So, so this is just a once over lightly, but it's about what is the military toolkit? Well, it's a bunch of stuff that you pop people with, you cut people with, and you ride around them and drive them nuts with, right? So it's a, so it has to do with, on the one hand, um, things, you know, th better, bigger and better spear points, bigger and better, uh, swords, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm not going to go down that particular path right now. Um, there certainly are people who uh, have take, take great delight in tracing the uh, evolution of weapons from one era to another. And But just to say that the, the, we're in, it's a, it's a dynamic um, situation in which somebody invents something and the guys next door go, uh oh, now what do we do? 
Oh man, look at those people. They so look so wonderful riding on those horses. Where did they get those saddles from? And it was must hurt a lot, or it does hurt a lot not having a saddle. So maybe we should invent saddles too. Um, and, uh, and 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 things like that. All right. So so ancient history is ancient history. And I'm going to bring some of it into play a little bit here, but I just want to give a sense that there is there's what I'm, I'm calling hardware. And then there's what I'm calling software. And this is going to be more like software lecture, right? So it's about the, the concepts. Once you start having a military toolkit, which I decided in the middle of it, I was actually misnaming it because I think it's called the weapons toolkit, the way I originally formulated it. And I decided, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to call it the weapons military toolkit. That way you get the, the larger context in which it is unfolding. And and the organization of armies, the organization of armies and their relationship to their carefully choreographed relationship to different components of armies um, is indeed a whole big piece of the military toolkit. So being able to, to say, okay, chariots, do it, right? Okay, horsemen, now you go, all right. Infantry, where are you? I need you infantry, right? So that kind of thing has to be, we have to sort of imagine some some master director uh, uh, putting on this particular show and trying to deal with it in a, in a, in a dynamic way. All right, so the military toolkit is a, is a very central process in world history. Indeed, in many ways, if we think about it, start thinking about it, um, what, is a, what is a more central one than this one? I'm not sure I could come up with it, but um, that's, that's where I went, went when I began res wrestling with this particular bear. So the whole history of the state, the state is an idea. The state also is a reality. It's the thing that collects taxes. It's the thing that uses those taxes to fund the military. It funds, funds other pious works and other things as well. But uh, but the, the the state is a is a uh, it, it sort of gets in your head once you know that you're part of a state, and then you realize that the, the this state has got connections that will tie you to other people. So the state is about controlling people. It's about controlling animals. It's controlling food, revenues, and indeed space. Right, so so once we say military toolkit, we that is the means to do this control. Is That's the, so the military toolkit it helps uh, helps the state do what it wants to do. It is indeed the dynamic part of what uh, what the and the, and the conceptual part about what the state does, and it is all about power, right? So power of all kinds, power to tell people that no, no, no. I told you we needed fourteen kilos of this rather than 12 which we had last year because um the, just the taxes have gone up i'm sorry so if you you know if you're providing sheaves of grain or if you're applying or, uh, you know supplying um squashes uh, same kind of story all right so so the the ability to tax people to uh, to to organize people to make them do this do that lie down in the field when the horses come running past whatever it may be um, all of those are part of what states do. Okay, so pause. So let's just think about what are some other toolkits that are connected to the weapons military toolkit. Because the other thing about the toolkit uh, analogy, right, the way in which we've been talking about technological concepts, uh, has to do with beer, beer. bureaucratic is misspelled. Oh dear. Um, so um, anyway, it, it is, has to do with thinking about um, how they flow into one another because it's a it's a dynamic situation. So something that starts out being part of mining and maybe the metallurgy complex, then in in, in round two ends up becoming oh well we can use these tunnels to put water in to to, to uh, have them be underground aqueducts basically and move water around underground from point A to point B if we're lucky. And if things don't go wrong, maybe it'll actually go where we're supposed to. Um, so the bureaucratic fiscal toolkit, which we haven't looked at, which is about record keeping, right, and uh, and accountability and so on. So that's certainly another one that belongs with the military toolkit. Um, the pyrotechnological one is about metallurgy of all kinds. And since metal is so crucially important, not just in cooking, but also in, uh, in uh, and, you know, it, in deploying power, right? Just to put it that way, 
uh, metal, metallurgy and having bigger and better metallurgy, having bronze. Oh my God, who invented bronze? There's a whole little rabbit hole we could go down and uh, battle around it for quite a while. Uh, animal power, the ability to harness animals, to organize animals, to train animals so they will do what we want to, to have done and in return for which they get our love and care and attention and occasionally they turn into breakfast. Um, so, uh, so animal power is very important in controlling um, uh, territory. So the whole idea of steppe empire cannot begin to be imagined unless we right away are queuing in animal power, right? So it's about cavalry forces, the ability to deploy cavalry forces across vast spaces to coordinate their activities and so on. All of this comes to a crescendo with the Mongols. So we're gonna end up with the Mongols in this lecture. In fact, we're gonna tiptoe tip past the Mongols, but it's the, the idea is, is the way in which power is being organized and controlled has to do with these other three um, toolkits. Well, there's a couple of other toolkits that we already have looked at that are also among the most important ones. And th those would include the water management slash hydraulics one, which we started out with, and also the maritime slash um, whatever it was. Um, what was that one? already. We have an Indian Ocean world, which we were talking about last time, but that has now become a very dynamic second Mediterranean. All sorts of products are being exchanged uh, uh, through that, um, and, and lots of people are getting rich. So Chinese Maritime toolkit as deployed by the Europeans, as opposed to how, as deployed in time one uh, under the auspices of, uh, of those who use the Indian Ocean world who are close to it, not those who are intruders into it, um, involves, that, see that was a long parenthesis, wasn't it? Um, in, it involves, um, I sometimes I get lost myself, right? So, so, so anyway, it involves a, uh, uh, involves the use of gunpowder weapons mounted on ships. So the thing that the Portuguese bring to the party when they intrude into the Indian Ocean world is they have guns mounted on ships, which they know how to use because they've already tested them on the Moroccans. Um, so onward. So now what I want to do is to talk about the Eurasian step. And so uh, I'm trying deliberately not to have us get bogged down. So I'm trying to just look at, stay, stay at a relatively high altitude here and if you're losing oxygen, uh, put up your hand and maybe we'll address that. Okay, so so the, the central part of the Eurasian step is the problem of pastoralists. So pastoralists are one, have one kind of power. They have one, that power gives them certain kinds of needs, things they need to do to, to make their lifestyle stay intact. Um, and, um, and the problem from the point of view of the agrarian people, the people who are part of what some have called agrarian or agrarianate uh, empire, right? The, so think ancient Rome, think, think the Egyptians, think Mesopotamians in the valleys, not the, well, the Mesopotamians up in the mountains, um, et cetera. So that, that would give you an idea of what the agrarian is. And then finally, there's mercantile power, just to throw that out too. So there's so those, those kinds of power make up in different proportions a lot of what goes on all across Afro-Eurasia. Different ecological contexts will put the kibosh on one or another. Not everybody gets to have, mil have animal power, pastoralists. So uh, that's particularly in the mid-arid zone where that is. So does not, for the most part, have to contend pastoralists. The yes, a bit stuff. People start flowing into the back ends of the uh, of uh, of the of the empire back in the, in Eastern Europe and on through into Germany and, and, and such like. So, but otherwise, the the, the 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 yeah. Sorry, go ahead. What what does downtown mean in this context? Well, it, it means out of out of civilization, quote unquote, out of city life, agrarian agrarian ape city life, for the fancy word, um, which has to do with 
uh, empires that fund themselves on on land taxes on 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 farmers, right? And those monies then are used to support the state. They are used to support its armies. They are used to support um, the religious. Usually, these the, the, the Marianne empires also have some kind of religious center to them. To them. Persia, what it means is that they devise a system in which is a kind, it's not unlike the things that get later get called feudalism that emerge in Western Europe half a millennium or more later, but well, has to do with an armored cavalry who require lots of food and their horses require lots of food and they tend to be larger horses than ordinary people's horses because who can walk around with all that armor on otherwise? Uh, and and so they are there to defend strong points of one kind or another, uh, access to key resources, access to key passes, strategic pathways from one part to another. So that that is their role. Then they are surrounded by, in an ethnically diverse area, which is Persia and on up into the Stans, where you know I'm talking about Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that is part of what I'm calling Persia here, Persianate world. Doesn't mean everybody speaks Persian. Quite the contrary, the state speaks Persian. But um, a lot of a lot of the people in the state are of different religions. They speak different languages. They are more or less willing to go along with being uh, under the Persian rule because the Persians are not doing what the Byzantines do, which is to perse persecute people because of their religious difference. In particular, the Byzantines seem to really like persecuting other kinds of Christians who are not of the of the kind that they are the followers of. Um, so also, I mean, so the so anyway, we could go off chasing rabbits here. Let's stop and not do that. All right. So so the so solutions then are solutions to the the pastoralist problem. So the pastoralists get more adept at at raiding around, and you have to be able to figure out how to hold them off at the pass and how to control access to key resources and key populations and key, key urban spaces. So that involves this uh, creation of the armored cavalry as a sort of permanently funded thing from the center or sometimes in other times when the state is not so powerful, then it has to sort of figure out a way to uh, extract resources from people to pay it, who are locals. But there also are local sort of volunteer cavalry forces and infantry forces that guard oases, that guard smaller cities and towns that go out into the steppe. So that's part of the pastoralist solution. They are relatively tolerant of others, right? So that's another aspect of, of, of their approach to doing this. Um, and, um, and, and then let's look at the China end. And the China end um, is initially one that is quite fraught. So it's, a, it's hey, it's time to build a great wall. Let's keep the nomads out of downtown. Um, let us, let us um, find a way to um, bash them anytime they raise their heads. That produces um, um, anger and resentment and bitterness on the part of the pastoralists who are just coming because they need to trade and because, hey, you're in the way, we're trying to get to our pasture land, which is on the other side of your field, um, and so on. So it's the, so the, the Chinese approach is initially an aggressive one. Uh, and, and a defensive one, and they're willing to put big resources into it, such as the Great Wall, right? So which takes, which is not something that is built in a moment. It takes many different dynasties over very long periods to put it together. And there are always bits and pieces of it that are lapsing into uh, crumble because they haven't been adequately funded or bad things have happened and they've had an earthquake in their downtown or who knows what's going on. All right, so the, so the, the Chinese solution is is one of trying to avoid having the the uh, the, the the pastoralists, you know, get involved in their business. Doesn't work. Persian one, in the end, doesn't work either because there are just too many pastoralists that are getting bigger and bolder, and they're more adept at being in contact with one another. And um, so the Persians and the Chinese, for different reasons and without ever having, I think, communicated with one another about it, adopt another strategy, which is, well, there are some friendly pastoralists, so friendly Turkic-speaking groups primarily. So we're, we're talking groups that speak mostly Turkish by this time. Other earlier groups, the Gosta, Visigoths, and all those people um, have already filtered on through uh, the Mediterranean world and have 
made the, made their bets and decided not to go around wherever they ended up. Um, but the, the in the case of the Chinese, it's the it's fi finding friendlies that you can deal with, right? That will accept Chinese rule, that will learn Chinese, that will venerate the Chinese emperor, that might even pay taxes. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, and that against the guys who are on the outside of the wall who are otherwise going to create problems all right so the so, um, so but then <clears throat> that's time one and then time two later on after the han as we get into the period under discussion here which get, takes us up to around 600 or so actually in the case of china we could go back a little bit further it's the origins of the tang dynasty t-a-n-g is my spelling um and um so um, the, the, the uh, Chinese state makes it its, its purpose to go out and to encounter the nomads on the other side of the wall as well. And they begin to interact. And so the peoples on the other side of the wall begin to learn some Chinese themselves. And uh, some of the, their leaders even are allowed to intermarry with um, uh, Chinese princesses. And, every, and so it, they get to know one another in, 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 in important ways. It sort of blends together. It's not unlike what happened in in uh, Germany and in Central Europe with the Romans, right? So if you have that model in your head, that that's another example of how how this kind of gradual over the centuries sort of settling in, working together, not quite trusting one another situation comes about. Persians do the same. So they the Arab conquest. So the Arabs are not, needless to say, Turkish speaking. Um, they speak a Semitic language related um, to Hebrew and to Berber, another um, important language. Um, so, uh, and the Berbers are mostly in North Africa. And pastoralists, although not only pastoralists. So, uh, so anyway, the Arabs, the Arab um, uh, uh, conquest of the Persian Empire, and then subsequently of the Byzantine Empire, which takes quite a bit longer, and they never quite get the job done, but they do flush them out of North Africa and get all the way to to Spain by um, 711 or thereabouts. Right. So the so the, uh, the so the the emergence of the Arabs who are based on pastoral nomadics, but who also have a lot of urban-based stuff going on too. Often gets lost in the, in the in the filters that Muhammad was actually an urbanite. Uh, he's not a pastoralist. He's a he's a businessman. Um, he goes on trips up into Syria and back, right? So that so so when Islam emerges, it is emerging on the fringes. Might think of it as un, not unlike what's happening with the Persian state and the Turks and on one side, on the fringes of the Persian Empire on the other side, where again there are these interactions. There are tame Arabs who are who are brought in to become the sort of defenders of the frontiers, the controllers of 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 uh, southern oases that guard the access to greater um, Palestine, Syria, etc. All right, so, so um, similar solutions in the end, uh, getting sort of involved. What the, what the nomads take, take away from this is we could organize empires too. Now we know how an army works. We can understand that armies are an important element in our military toolkit. Uh, we can we can begin to develop such thing, even though we stay with pastoral power. That is the in the particularly in the steppe world where you don't have big high mountains for the most part that are uh, in play uh, in in contests of power. Uh, the the, the we, we, uh, pastoral power can be deployed in uh, fascinating ways, and and uh, and so the what happens is that the military toolkit undergoes some symbiosis you know both both learn from it but the Chinese are Chinese and the, and the Persians are pushed off the historical stage by the rise of the Arabs the Arabs incorporate the Persian ways right so that they continue to have Persian bureaucrats rule under our rule so that's an important thing to think about so the whole the history of bureaucracy uh, is a, is a per, is largely a Persian history right they are the ones who are the bearers of what it is and that goes all the way back to Babylonia. Right, so they they are the ones who figure it out, and then they they um, identify groups of people who are apt to think in that fashion, um, and then they uh, and they make them into a kind of ruling 
past that can help tell people, tell the state what it needs to know about um, who's behind in their taxes and such like. All right, so back again to um, Persia and China. So the Persian Chinese ability to control um, ends of the step by 750 or so has totally faded. So 750 is an Islamic date. That's the date of the Abbasid revolution, which is a major movement within early Islam. And they last until 1244 when they are overthrown by the Mongols. Uh, all right, so on the, on the Chinese end of the step, um, you've got similar kinds of things going on. The Tang dynasty are actually a mixed ethnic group. They aren't, and they have a lot of Buddhism happening uh, under their uh, aegis, so that they already are not China, Chinese in the way in which the Han had been. Uh, that gets recrystallized under the dynasty that comes after that, who are the Song. Sorry with all these dynasties, but um, just there's only a couple to remember, really. It's just, it, and it's just, it's the, the primary, the primary thing I'm trying to get across is the idea that that controlling the step and then the way in which the step peoples respond to this is going to be the dynamic that is going to shape Asian history and it, the, the mainland Eurasian history uh, for the next several millennia. All right, so we've already, I've already done this bit. This is, gives you something to look at, at least. So the agrarian pastorals and mercantile kinds of social power. And then the great reshuffle that happens is the old solutions that the Chinese and the Persians had had in play um, uh, begin to crumble. And partly they're crumbling because pastoralists are coming in on both ends. Partly they're crumbling because the, the, their inability to sustain the funding of the old model that had been based on, an, on a, a, a staunch state-supported um, uh, cavalry system. Um, all right, so and and then this cultural symbiosis. All right, so um, where are we? I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot on by um, my deadlines here, so uh, we're gonna be out of here in, a, in the next twenty minutes, I bet. Um, <laughs> so uh, we do do think of nice nice things to uh, talk about uh, as we're going along. All right, so so the now flash you know flash ahead. So it's been here. We've been talking about. The Asian step and how it was controlled, and how military power, the deployment of military power, particularly cavalry forces, have been a key element in, in doing that. So, what I want to say is that there is a global military revolution. Some of you that either are or know people who are military history buffs will think that possibly the military revolution, that is a term that is used by European historians, is something that happens in the 17th. And um, to a degree that there's there's much to be said for that. But what the thing that is important to understand uh, is that European seaborne empires do not make any in inroads in, in the greater uh, uh, steppe world. So the major empires that are put in play after the Mongols, we have, um, but the, 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 those 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 empires use gunpowder weapons and they last, you know, all the way on through. So the Russian Empire I'm seeing is being the Tsarist Russian Empire is part of this. The, the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Safavid Empire. Uh, there's always an Afghan Empire. The name changes from time to time. There's the, the Indian Mughal Empire and there's the Chinese Empire. All of these are all subspecies of what the Mongols wrought in a way and of the use of gunpowder by um, by complex uh, imperial uh, forms that have been have come about as a result of this interaction of different peoples, different types of power. All right, so um, let me just pause for a second. Um, all right, let's just charge on. Um, the next part is why China, because here, here we are, we're, we're in another one of those moments that um, are surprising uh, when we think that the military revolution is something, and gunpowder indeed, is something that is first developed in Europe. Turns out, no, 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 not true. Uh, we can find examples of Chinese use of gunpowder uh, in the field of battle in various different ways, not yet shooting projectiles, right? So that's the full test of, of gunpowder. If you're firing a bullet or a cannonball or, or, or something, then, uh, then you're you know, you have 
you were part of the military revolution. But the gunpowder revolution is an older one and has larger, more diverse roots. So it include so it and it's relatively easy to assemble. So the saltpeter, the, the carbon, the uh, uh, the and the sulfur put together in certain proportions with the right incantations muttered over them will produce something that will explode more or less uh, as you would expect it. If you do it wrong, it doesn't explode as you expect it, and maybe you don't survive either, or maybe it just sort of sits there and simmers. Um, all right, so so our question is then, how did the Chinese do it? Um, so the so um, it starts with things like rockets, right? So here's an early example. Uh, and rockets are good, and they're very nice to scare the horses of uh, of pastoralists. So rockets can come into play. They also could, for people who haven't seen them, the swish bang part of a of a rocket uh, can be terrifying. Later on, if you see that it's actually not doing any damage, then you can go, oh well, here's a, here comes a rocket. Gee, isn't that pretty? Right, but that's but mostly the use of rockets um, comes out of something that is very Chinese, and it involves firecrackers, right? So firecrackers and 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 and, and, and uh, making explosions on festival days and so on becomes part of a Chinese tradition. Um, the origins of which I'm not actually fully in hand on, and maybe some of you would know. But the Chinese are definitely using cannon. Uh, they are they are using different kinds of handheld um, weapons already by the Song period, which is the pre-Mongol period. Right. So it's a so it so it's important to understand that and and this transits into the hands of the of the steppe peoples of the Chinese under the steppe. Right. So that and it is through that medium that it will then spread all the way across um, Eurasia, um, uh, ending up in Europe. All right. So the 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 Chinese steppe frontier is the place of experimentation. For the development of different components of the of this um, the use of gunpowder. Gunpowder also is, of course, most importantly used for making um, explosive charges that can either be taken to the walls of the city and somebody digs some holes and stuffs it in there and lights it and runs like hell, and the wall comes tumbling down. Or they can be you can have a catapult and you can fire a gunpowder um, charge into the city. Uh, and do some heavy damage that way too. So there's a early sort of pre-technological almost or early technological ways in which gunpowder can be used as an explosive to do damage to cities. Usually gunpowder weapons are not so much of use in, in, in the prairie, right? So riding around with with, uh, with your Mo Mongol buddies, uh, there's not a lot of shooting guns under, under the bellies of your horse, right? That's a whole different thing. That's a whole different narrative. Um, but it is, but it becomes a very key component whenever you, whenever a steppe people uh, or anyone else surrounds an enemy city, uh, then the gunpowder stuff is brought forward. Um, oh, Terry, question on that. So governments try to protect their technology. Was this something that the Chinese could protect, or did any village know how to make gunpowder? Well, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Does anybody know the answer to that question? Because that is a, that is a key question, and I, I I don't have an answer for it. I'm, no doubt there is one, hmm. uh, and we will uh, scurry back and dig around and see what we can come up with. But uh, that that you know, so how does how does knowledge of gunpowder get developed? How does how does it be, be kept sort of under the control of the state? Those are very important elements. But in this dynamic of the of the social frontier, in which Chinese and, and pastoralists are interacting, or um, Arabs and Persians, Muslims on one end, and and and, and Turkish speaking um, um, people are interacting on the other end of the frontier, uh, it's I'm sure it's quite difficult to keep things um, secret too long. Right. So yes, you could do it for a generation or two. Uh, little bits and pieces would seep out, uh, and uh, and these empires are quite vast, and so some areas are rather better to control than than others, and so that would also, you know, the, you can't you can't you know, keep a secret for terribly long if the context is world history, right? If it's a context that's a few years, of course. Right. 
there's our Mongol Empire. Ain't it pretty? All right. So, so, uh, so the, the Mongols come, interrupt this program long about 1240. So that it depends on where we are. They're actually they've been busily involved in chopping off the bits and pieces of the northern Chinese Empire prior to this time. Um, but uh, but by 1240 actually is 1244 or something is the is my date. Somewhere in there, uh, uh, Baghdad falls to the to the Mongols, right? And soon thereafter, Mongol Mongol ponies are are riding riding through Poland, right? So it's a it's it's the Mongols get quite a ways into Europe. It's quite surprising. Mong, Mongols are are at the Adriatic, yeah. where that is, right? So, uh, and so uh, so the Mongols get quite a ways into Europe, and then a magic thing happens, and the great Khan dies. The Khan is the is the emperor. Right, the great Genghis Khan dies, and so in, the, in their succession system, all of the princes who think that they are likely to have a, have a role in the succession to the state uh, drop everything and charge back to uh, you know, which would take them months and months and months, uh, charge back to Ulaanbaatar where they will um, do get out over who gets to be the successor. Yeah, I, I can't read the dark gray area there. Oh, hang on. Probably so, yeah. Hang on. So, so I I actually have a solution, which is close your eyes. You're not supposed to peek there. <laughs> so so um, that that solves our problem by not not addressing it. But <laughs> Terry, I think it said Kingdom of Dali. Is that right? I don't know. That's <laughs> mystery. Yeah. All right. So, but this, so just just to give you the dynamic, and this is actually not at all about uh, the Mongols. So the Mongol roads are are there, but this is this is about where Marco Polo went, right? So at least it, it gives you, but it gives you a different map of Eurasia in the Mongol period, and then, because that is indeed the time when Marco Polo um, went on his travels, and it's also prior to that time is when Ibn Battuta, the great Moroccan uh, traveler, goes all the way from Tangier, Morocco. To uh, to China, right? With little side trips here and there, it takes him much of his life to do all that. Um, okay, so um, so this, I put this one up because it gives you an idea of what comes after the Mongols. So the names of these polities will be totally unfamiliar, right? Because they are they are Mongolate, Mongoloid. No, we can't say that. Um, um, but, but they so the Khanate of the Golden Horde, right, is a particular kind of, of, of Turkic group that speak who are called the Kipchak, who speak a language of Turkish is divided into sub major languages, which are kind of sort of like the Romance languages, right? So you could fake it a little bit and you could sort of maybe understand somebody who isn't the way you were brought up. But um, then there are these differences. But as you can see, well into Russia and indeed to into Hungary. There is Mongol rule and post-Mongol rule, because this is about the post-Mongol era, just to give you a sense. So this is like a century and a half or two from the 1200s to the 1400s. Jingil Khans, that's these guys, I-L-K-H-A-N, are another species of um, Mongol successor state, and they control much of what had previously been the Abbasid Empire. Um, up to but not including Egypt or indeed Palestine. So, um, so and that's a, that's a, that is quite a big one. And it includes uh, all of the Persian domains that have been part of the Abbasid state on down to the frontiers of India and to parts of Afghanistan. Then there is the Jagadai, who are these guys in the middle here. Uh, and, uh, and they are still another group of, of direct descendants of, of, of of um, of the great uh, lineage of the Mongol uh, kingship, um, and it is from them that Tamerlane, a name some of you may know, who is a who is a descendant, uh, and 1400 to go rampaging around here and there uh, for some small period, uh, uh, and he pretty much breaks up a lot of the post-Mongol states that have, that were existed in the Middle East. And then there's the Chinese end, right? So, so notice one thing. 
India is not part of the deal, right? So the, the Mongols did not get to India, which is has, if you believe these population statistics, which are were put together by Eurocentric people using the graphic um, um, things to give you historical demographies over long periods of time. Um, the population of India very likely exceeded that of China in this period, right? So that's that's something to think about. And absence of Mongols may have something to do with that, right? It just just could, just saying. Um, but <laughs> but if and of course, in the on are that precedes this. That's in the 1200s, um, and and then there's also um, major climate change that's happened, right? So the, the the period in and around which the Mongols are operating is one that in which there are climatic and ecological vectors that are very important in in weakening the ability of old state systems, old empires to defend themselves. So that certainly is on the table uh, as, as a component. And, and India is relative, it's not exempt from these, but it, it and, and climate happens differently in different places and even different sides of the hill, as we know all too well with the Santa Cruz. So, um, so, um, so the, the period from about 1150, 1200, on through until 1400 is this transitional period. After that is when we get the 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 emergence of um, gunpowder um, states. Hang on, now let's just back up and see what we need to scoop up. Okay, here we go. All right, so let's talk about Mongols. Right, this, I, whenever I was teaching um, any kind of history that had any got anywhere near. The Mongol period, I will always put in a, a lecture on the Mongols because it was always the best lecture that, that anybody ever had because they never knew anything about them and they were so amazed at what they did. I can't do all that in one gulp here, but so th let me just tell you some things that are important to know about the Mongols. So the Mongols are a steppe people. They do not speak Turkish. Um, they uh, they flourish on the, on the northwestern frontiers of China. They are a relatively small group of whole another whole element of what will become the mongols capital capital um are uh are un, are in alliance with the with the chinese right so so it's another one of those places of the step where the chinese sort of pick their and they have just suffered a major defeat the people who who um lick themselves off and stand up and say god damn it we're not going to take this bullshit right and they pull off this amazing thing so they have an ability to, this has been tested, this is part of the toolkit too, I'm sure we could say. So part of the toolkit is putting together alliances so that you can draw on other elements in the in the step people's um, sort of uh, political vocabulary. So everything is kin organized, right? And that is to say, so not, not ethnically, because many of these people would all speak Turkish of one kind or another, the Mongols, as I say, do not. Um, uh, but they are able to incorporate other Step peoples, and as they as they go across Asia, like a snowball rolling downhill, they just pick up all the step peoples that they encounter that are up to the deal, um, and so they get to have formidable armies by the time they arrive in the Islamic world and in the and in the western end of the step in Russia and in Poland and such like. All right, so it's a so so the one element then is that the ability to make alliances uh, and have those alliances matter by intermarrying with the leaders. Right, that would be one element. And then also posting Mongol princes along the side of those of those intermarried princes who are not of the Mongol um, uh, kinship, but just to make sure that they're sort of doing it right. Right. So they have so that kind of system. That is, is the system that has worked out in China. The Chinese do exactly this. Right. So this is the experimentation is one of these things that blows up in in in, in unforeseeable ways, and the Chinese are the first to suffer. Right. So the other thing that they do is that they claim to have universal rule. So the, the slogan is one sun in heaven, one on earth. And if that doesn't terrify you, nothing does. Right. And and so and, and yet, and yet, right? So what is their religion? Right? So are they shamanist, which many Turks are of one kind or another? Well, that thing I just said means probably not. So it's some kind of sky god, 
right? Universal sky god, that is already well salted all across the steppe. So, so it comes out differently in different places. And, you know, if you go back into the early history of, of Judaism, for example, there are examples of, there are, there are other gods than Yahweh, right? So if you poke around it, uh, and, and there even are female goddesses, right, who, get, who are mentioned, right? Um, so, uh, so the, the uh, I forget who exactly it is that does this, it may be the Assyrians or maybe a, a group that comes before them in Mesopotamian area, start experimenting with, every time you conquer somebody, this starts going on in Mesopotamia and, and in the areas around it, Every time you conquer somebody, one of the ways you welcome them into the club is you say, tell you what, it's a big world. There are lots of gods and goddesses. You know what we're going to do? We're going to take a couple out of your pantheon and put them in our pantheon, right? And so, so everybody gets to understand that, you know, we are big and we are generous and we're all part of the same, um, um, you know, sort of spiritual community, if you will. Uh, which primarily affects really only the elite and urban diets, not really people in the countryside very much at all. So, so basically, in some ways, what the Mongols are selling is a somewhat similar kind of an arrangement. But if you if you accept that there's a universal mission, and the universal mission is for the Mongols to conquer, right? That's the gist of the story, and that they have universal rule. Then, it, you know, it all sort of follows. They organize. So they re, re, they rejigger re the kinship so that the kin, so that the kinship system is one in which um, uh, now it's divided by tens uh, by tens tens and hundreds and thousands and so on so it's more like think of Roman legions or something so the, they build the family and they say no 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 let's reorganize this right so they put it on a more militarily sensible kind of a basis. But it's still quote unquote kinship. So that's how you have to then think about yourself. So a much easier way, a much more powerful way of being able to assert claims to, to um, being drafted, just put it that way, to being susceptible of coming along uh, and be, uh, joining in um, the, uh, the warfare. Mongols have, uh, have carried in their sort of cultural genetics, just to make up a term that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, uh, a, 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 which is perhaps suspect in other ways. Let's not go too far with it, but uh, but have have this notion that um, things that they learn from the Chinese <clears throat> stick around, right? And the ones that are used continue to be useful. They continue to use and, and, and develop further, right? So one of the things that that, that they get get going on is something called the annual hunt. All right, so the annual hunt is an occasion in which boys will be boys. They all go out and they go to some particular area that has been predetermined um, and um, they surround it. And it could be Santa Cruz County or it could be all of California, right? Depends on how big your ambitions are and how many people you have in this party. And you gather around the campsite and you sing wonderful songs and, um, and you have great feasts and so on. But for, before you can do that, you have to do the annual hunt. And that involves creating a network of people who are all going to go around whatever the space is that's been decided. And then you gradually conquer, 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 and, 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 and driving all the game before you. So that then you have this vast slaughter of game in the middle of the, of the prairie somewhere. And then you have the wonderful parties that everybody always talks about. Right. So, so that is the annual hunt. So what do, what do we just see here? What we've seen is a way of deploying power and utilizing power of cavalry forces operating at vast distances, hundreds of miles across, where they are in communication with one another. Oh, wait a minute, that wing has gone a little bit too far, so now go, et cetera. All right, so this is a, so, so the, the ability of the Mongols to, uh, to organize and deploy their forces over vast distances and to stay in touch the whole time. That's something that is really new, right? And that is something that really explains their power. And it comes with other things too. Here, open the Chinese toolkit. So siege craft of all kinds, gunpowder weapons, blow up the fortress, uh, all of that kind of thing. Psychological warfare is another element of it. So um, we'll just, we go up to the city, we send in spies well in advance, 
days and months and yes, they walk around, poke around, they see, oh, so these guys don't really like the government. Why is that? What is it that we can play on that will get them to sign up with us? Right? So they, they do a lot of careful sort of uh, ex experimentation, looking around to see where they might potentially have allies. So cities are a pain in the butt to conquer. You don't want to have to surround them. It slows down the advance. It's so much more fun to be out on the prairie riding around on your horse, conquering territory that has nobody in it. Um, <laughs> but but if when you come to a city, you've got to go, we got to get this over with, right? I mean, gee. So, so the way you do that is you deploy all kinds of psychological warfare. One of them is that you have a you have a path, and and they always send up somebody. Sort of a delegation goes up to the town, and they say, "Okay, here we are. We're the Mongols." Cower, cower. Uh, and, and then <laughs> and then the locals pull themselves together, and the, and then the Mongols say, "Okay, so we'll make it real simple for you." So will you let us in or not? If you don't let us in, bad things will happen. We won't say what, but anyway, just use your imaginations. So, so then they would say no. Oh dear, what a mistake. So then every single person will be slaughtered, infants and children and everybody. Uh, and, and their skulls will be taken in piles outside the city. And you can see, so legend has it, I think this is the Marco Polo thing, but maybe it comes from somewhere else. The the the, the sort of skulls in the distance and the towers of skulls, right? All right. So that's the that that so once that happens a time or two, when the Mongol emissary comes to your house or comes to your city and he says, Well, guys, bad things may happen, they go, Oh Jesus. <laughs> sure, I caught in, right? What's a beer? We could do that too. Right. Question. I understand that the point of it's true that a lot of times when they do that with the big class they kill everybody, but they wouldn't kill the hearts they grab hearts. Well, and that's true too. Exactly. So, so the so the other part of it. So this is not crazy fanatic. This with the with real science, right? In so far as it is, anybody who does useful stuff that they can they can utilize, I pick them up and take them along. Oh, you're a silk weaver. Damn, we just love silk. Come along, right? We're setting up a city over here. You guys are in on the ground floor. All those silk weavers that are there, well, you'll join them. Yeah. And uh, and so so they do that, and so and so it's it's they and what what they're doing is they're cross pollinating all different handicrafts and and so on all across Asia, right? With things that are useful. So that was a very useful, that was a helpful question. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so uh, we we are going to have to stop real soon. Um, maybe indeed I'll. Well, what are I going to do? I, I could have. I keep misspelling bureaucracy too. That's driving me crazy. Um, all right, so so the, so let's just do the end of this page. So so um, one of the distinctive features of the of the Mongol state is that the bureaucracy is the is the military, and the military is the is the bureaucracy, right? So they don't have a separate bureaucracy in the way in which the Persians or the Byzantines or the Romans or the Chinese indeed um, did. So if you're if you are part of the Mongol army, you are part of the Mongol bureaucracy, and so and, and which is which is, could be good and it could be bad, but it, it, it means that, that there's a sort of a, what was I going to say? I was going to say something that might not be pertinent, but um, anyway, uh, the the bureaucrats have a, have a direct because they are also military uh, need to get it right, right? They they can't mess they can't mess with making making up things or listening to the little voices that are saying hey do it our way from the locals they say no 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 this is what we're going to do we're going to just organize it in the following fashion and the following fashion is okay your fields are great for growing stuff our horses like to eat tell you what we're going to take a portion of your fields and we're going to turn them over to that because armies do not travel on their stomachs and. Horses need need food in order to travel, and so we need to uh, just do this. So, so land for pasture is taxed at one level, and land for feeding people in cities is taxed at a higher level, right? So they just jimmy the jimmy the tax system around a little bit, so, and they and they can get things to happen the way they would like. 
All right, so that's a, that. Is, so that is an example of how this bureaucracy thing operates. But it's also it's a kinship state. So it also means that there are brothers and cousins, and, you know, cousins down to the third generation that are out there who are potentially rivals. Right. So that creates a problem because you get family feuds, and the family feuds are going on, and they involve large, potentially large numbers of people who break off and decide that they're going to be part of this thing. So those different little dynasties, big dynasties, huge territories, results of kin-driven politics. So, so that is that is what happens too. So the, the, there is a post mongol um, imperial era, which is on the frontiers of China and also on the frontiers of the, of the Middle East, including the Byzantine Empire, and to some extent, part of it and some extent on the outside of it. Uh, and, it, and, it and it is in those areas that a lot of new stuff is going to happen and gunpowder weapons are going to reemerge in, in a big way um, at the end. So actually, I, I, I did okay by Mongols, I think. And uh, we can all have a break now. Yeah. Okay, so the so that's the Mongol empires. One more time, uh, and and it is indeed quite amazing to to just to contemplate. Now, looking looking at that map, you'll see a few um, bits and pieces that will later become important in in the larger furniture of the mid arid zone, which have to do with the on the one hand the Ottoman Empire, which goes all the way at one point by the by the 1517 or so, goes all the way to the Moroccan border, right, which is quite a ways. So all the way across Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, um, and, and that's the Ottoman state. The Ottoman state includes Arabia, so includes Egypt, um, which they take over from a uh, another um, Islamic um, force called the Mamluks, and Syria as well. All right, so 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 that's the that's the Ottomans. And then, and then there, the, the Persian Empire uh, has to emerge from under the buzzing and feuding uh, of the various different post-Mongol groups uh, before it begins to come about uh, in a new way. Uh, there's, there's, there is, in, there is Mughal India. I'm going to have these all written down on the screen in the next slide. Um, uh, there is Russia. There is China. And then there is always something in the middle. More or less in and around where Afghanistan is, that seems to be a magic spot where um, certain of the Mongol groups sort of uh, settle, settle themselves down. Whoops, now that's not working. I used that. Oh, here we are. Let's try that. Nope. No, look, backwards. Let me just see if I can back up. All right, so let's talk about the gunpowder gun revolution as a global event. All right, this is something world historians fear to tremble, but uh, or tremble to do. Uh, anyway, it is it is a big deal, uh, and, or it used to be a big deal before we got riveted by the daily news. Um, so the traditional narrative is that the gunpowder revolution that was that's what a couple of historians called it. They are somebody named Jeffrey Parker and somebody named. Michael, whoops, what it is, anyway, Jeffrey Parker is the most common one, and he's the G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y, Jeffrey kind of a guy, all right, and a nice man, um, and so the, so the gunpowder revolution uh, starts in Europe in the 16th century, uh, and as a result of it, and so it, the modern states emerge within Europe, so France stops being a, a whole bunch of splinter regimes, Burgundy, this, that, the other, and becomes France. Ile de France becomes all of France. Um, and Germany makes some strides towards becoming Germany, but it doesn't quite make it in this immediate period. So the 16th century, they're still in the process of putting that together. Um, putting together um, Britain as the United Kingdom is now underway also. So this is another phenomenon that's going on uh, um, the emergence of a modern Prussian state uh, and a modern uh, Russian state uh, are also part, part things that fall out as a result of all of this. So the traditional narrative has to do with the consolidation of power within Western Europe, the emergence of, of states in something like their current form, Britain and France primarily, the others not so much. Italy is what takes a very long time to be put together. Same thing is true, of course, of Germany. And then uh, as a result of the gunpowder revolution and the ability of the Europeans to project it 
around the world, they have this huge colonial empire. And there's your story, folks. So just go home and be happy, right? <laughs> um, and that and that is a way of telling that story. Uh, and and the global dominance of of uh, Europe lasts until the middle of the 20th century, when colonialism disappears. But of course, the melody lingers on, and it's still lingering. Okay. So on the other hand, there's another way of approaching this, and the other way of approaching it is to is to say a couple of things. Uh, at least one of which I, th I think I said earlier in this lecture, which has to do with the ability of the Portuguese, later the Spanish, and then still later some other laggards, the Dutch, and then the French and the British, to project their power into the Indian Ocean world and around the globe, right? So that means the Americas, or America, if you like, uh, and Africa. Uh, and, um, and that they are able to do by a series of fortuitous uh, uh, happenstances on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, they uh, they they actually there are some places they can't get to because um, the, they are running running up against these post-Mongol steppe empires. All right, so so let's take it slowly. So the 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 Americas, the quick story. I think I gave bits of this the last time, and I hope I didn't mess it up too bad. But uh, it, it has to do with the fact that when the Portuguese and, and the Spanish come to the new, to the so-called new world, due to who, uh, uh, and of course Columbus did in, indeed continue to think that he had landed in Japan, so hmm, where did he think he got to? Uh, so there is that problem. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, the peoples of the Americas were not uh, on the same a larger exchange of diseases that the rest of Eurasia had been on. Right, and therefore we have what is called um, the Great Dying, and the Great Dying is the um, is the collapse of of the populations all throughout the Americas as a result of diseases that were unwittingly and wittingly, aha, brought by the Spanish and the Portuguese. Um, and so I think I used the statistic before that the population of the Valley of Mexico, which was a major population center when uh, Cortez arrives there in 1517 or whenever it is, probably messed up that date, but uh, somewhere in there, um, is, uh, is, is around 20 million, 20 and a half million, something like that. And uh, a century later, it's 1 million or 1 and a half million. So, so massive decline, over 90% die off, right? And that's in population centers, in areas where, where, where the, which are not part of larger states, the, the other one that experiences a similar kind of collapse is the Incan Empire. So the Incan Empire goes up and down the Andes Cordillera, all the way from Chile, all the way on, on up. Uh, and it is all integrated and it, and it has a state of its own, which is quite remarkable in many different ways. Uh, and um, within um, a century or so, that too has utterly collapsed. So that's the first thing. So what? how did, the, how did Columbus and the gang think that they were going to um, pay for their voyages is a question, right? Yeah. Well, the answer to that has to do with what they had been doing previously. So what they've been doing previously consists of two things. And I'm not going to spend any amount of time on this, but I'm just going to mention them. So one of them has to do with what is euphemistically called the Reconquista, or we could call it the Conquista, to be more fair, because it is actually seven centuries, and the people doing the conquisting are not necessarily all present and accounted for when we're starting this particular story. In, in any event, it has to do with the expulsion of the Muslims and Jews from Spain, right? And, and indeed Portugal. And the Portuguese story um, has to be disentangled from the, from, uh, the Isabel and Ferdinand story because it's a, it happens a lot sooner, right? So by 12, the 1240s already, Muslims have been expelled from Portugal, what will become Portugal. Uh, and, and the Portuguese already are becoming adept at using cannon mounted on um, ships, right? So that is the that is the key transformation. Spanish are not so into that. Spanish are slow to pick up on, uh, on the use of guns and firearms as well. Uh, and it's really only after um, the artillerymen that are in the service of the Granada and Islamic State, fall of Granada being the final fall of the curtain on Islamic power in Spain in 1492, right? So, so it's 1492 is a big year. A lot of stuff is going on. That's just one of them. Um, and, um, and, and indeed the funding 
of Columbus's voyage comes from the pillage of Granada. All right, so stuff starts fitting together when you begin thinking in bigger ways about it. Right. Um, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, so uh, 49, 1492 is when um, the fall of Granada and then the plunder of the Islamic lands that have been taken over, especially here in Granada, is used to fund the Colombian voyages. Right. So it's, it has this sort of little sting in the tail. It's going to sting twice because it's also then going to hit the populations of the Americas in unfortunate ways. All right. So 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 that so Spain is slow to pick up on gunpowder weapons. That's the key thing I want you to think about. This is a gunpowder weapon story here, uh, and and uh, and the the Grenadans are able to hold hold the fort literally uh, until 1492 because they have a military guard of, of, of artillerymen who are in the employ of the Granada ruler. And those guys begin to be picked away by Ferdinand and Isabella, who say, hey, we'll pay better, get vacations, all kinds of terrible things will happen. Just come and join us. All right. So, um, so, uh, so they begin to do that, right? So it's not really until they defect from from uh, Granada that that there is a that the, the the stage is set for the final collapse of the Muslim, of Muslim power in Spain. <clears throat> All right, so it, there's a military history story here that that often gets lost. Again, back to the back to the previous point, the Portuguese have been doing their own thing. For a century and a half or more before all this, three centuries, two and a half. I can't do math very well when I'm talking. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so they then decide that they will not only uh, engage in in helping out their Spanish friends, potentially for a price, but also uh, to extend the Reconquista across the Straits of Gibraltar um, all the way to um, Morocco. All right. So, there's a, so the Reconquista is a project that wants to go on the road. It's not one that it conceives of itself as being Iberia is all we want. They, what they want is just get rid of Muslim power wherever we see it, right? And so uh, they push themselves across to, to the Americas where there are no Muslims, but they take the ways in which they had governed Muslims and dealt with Muslims in the process of the conquest with them. So all those things that we know about the labor systems and so on that, that are imposed on native peoples are first done, are first imposed on Muslims in Spain. Right. And so, and um, the expulsions and the, you know, just all of the, the, the horrors of the conquest are all part of how they organize themselves. At the bottom, the pay for problem, right, is the one I wanted to get back to. So I talked about, so here's Columbus, he's paying for his voyages with some of the proceeds of the, of the conquista. But he also needs to do something else, which is he needs to imagine how he's going to operate when he gets to wherever it is, because he doesn't actually really know where it's gonna be. And, um, but the nearest avatar of what that would look like are the Canary Islands. Because the Canary Islands, and starting in late medieval times, in which the Portuguese have played an important role in the beginning, and later the French and the Breton and who knows who all, various others get to take part too, uh, gets turned into a vast plantation, right? So locals are, are pretty much expunged. They too, they have not been in contact. So they're a little bit like what happens in the Americas. They, they do not have... Um, disease resistance against the disease that they presented <clears throat> upon them in the body of, the, of, the, of these conquerors. And so the Canarians also um, tend to go away. Their land is taken, their forests are cut down. Uh, so there's a de major deforestation thing going on in the Canaries. Um, and then in addition to that, then we start growing um, sugar to be produced for a world market. And sugar is something that is already being produced in Cyprus and in the Mediterranean world under Islamic, Islamic auspices. And they're thinking, let us do this, as, uh, and Canary Islands is the perfect place to do it. And so the conquest of a lot of little islands that are in the Atlantic, just off the coast of Africa, is similarly motivated. Right? It doesn't always work out because it's not necessarily, not every place is, is a good place to grow sugar. Columbus gets to the Americas, he brings with him some primitive machinery that had been, been developed as part of the sugar trade. And he's looking forward while he's going back to celebrate and report to uh, 
Ferdinand and Isabel, he's looking for the guys he left behind to organize sugar production in where, where he landed, right? And, um, and that story veers off in an unforeseen direction when the guys discover, oh, gold in Endar Hills? Well, maybe silver anyway. Uh, and so they just drop everything and they say, sugar, sugar, why do we want this? Let's just, let's just go for the, for, you know, what's ready to hand. So they go and they go chasing after people that know where there might be sugar, I'm sorry, sugar, silver and or, and or gold. And that becomes, that then becomes the thing that drives the machine. But it's not the sugar, the, sorry, the, the silver story, the silver of the America story, which makes Spain a great power is something we have to then hit a parenthesis. And it's not until the end of the 16th century that they're really fully able to draw on that because they haven't yet hit the mother load in various different places. So it's the timing of silver. When does silver actually get discovered and can it be extracted from the Americas to fund what Spain and or Portugal would like to do? All right, so, so just keep that in the back of your head because there's someone, Vasco da Gama goes around Africa and into uh, India. Uh, he goes bringing presents. We talked about this toward the end last time. And those presents are regarded by the Indian ruler in the, in the little port town um, that he manages to go into as being totally insignificant baubles that are of no use to anybody. All right, so, so, the, um, so the, the, the point here is basically Portuguese don't have anything to trade to Indians that Indians want. And that continues to be a vexing problem. So what do they want? They want pepper. Then they would like some other spices too, please, or maybe mm -hmm. not so please, depending. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so they, so they do that. Far. Um, and but they still don't. They still haven't solved their silver problem. So, so they have to, they have to do some make make dues. So they so conquering. Conquering boats of the high sea and taking whatever they've got turns is one of them, uh, and then they they just they start rampaging a little bit. But the problem is, and here's where the story is going to come to the screen in front of us: they have no luck in conquering India at all. You would have thought, oh, gunpowder weapons, European master narrative rules, everybody should lie down in the street and allow the Europeans to come uh, come in. Well, that's not how it plays out because guess what? The gunpowder revolution is a world revolution. It starts in China. The, the, the Ottomans are able to conquer uh, all, of the, all of the Middle East and all of the leftover bits of Eastern Europe, including work to the gates of Vienna, because they have gunpowder weapons and they are organized systematically into gun artillery corps, the Janissary Corps, start, the famous Janissary Corps, one of the units of the of the Ottoman army starts out as a group of gunners. Later, their tasks are shifted around a bit. They also have a whole series of other nicely devised sub-military units that operate in a Mongol fashion. The bureaucrat is the is the is the is the, is the military um, ruler officer, sorry, and and vice versa. The military officer is the bureaucrat. So this so the so the Ottoman state is operating on a Mongol model, even though the Mongols never got there. Right, um, and uh, the same thing is true of of the uh, Safavid Empire, which is sort of in the middle of the pack there. If you're looking up from the bottom, which comes on a little bit later, the the Ottomans have the luxury of not being in a place that is being conquered by um, the um, the Mongols and dealing with the, the sort of collapse of the Byzantine, the remains of the Byzantine Empire, and so that that has to be done piecemeal. It takes a long time before. Um, 1453 rolls around, but 1453 is the, is the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, right? So that's your big day. So 1492 is the other big day. So, so everybody looks at 1492 saying, Europe is on the march, we kick an ass, we're getting those Muslims and Jews out of here, it's good, right? There's nothing wrong with this story. But that happens in 1492. Something in the meantime has happened that's rather embarrassing to, to Europeans, to Christians, so let's put it that way, which is the fall of Eastern Europe to the Ottomans and of the Byzantine Empire, right? So, so gunpowder weapons allow the Ottomans to do make this major territorial grab. And Ottoman rule liked, um, 
like um, the rule of, um, of, of the Mongols, is a rule that allows the use of people who are not Muslim, various different kinds, different, different languages also. So there's a, a language and ethnicity sort of component to this. So the Ottomans are relatively pacific. In the meantime, Europe is devouring itself in the war of revolution or of religion, right? So it's Martin Luther, all of that stuff is going on right in the same period. 1517 is the nailing of the theses on the door of the church by Luther, right? So that kicks off, that kicks off the whole um, struggle that will go on in which Protestants and Catholics are at it for the next century and more. All right, so, so toleration from the Ottomans, where do, the, where do many of the Jews of Spain go? They go to the Ottoman Empire, right? They get a good deal. Um, it, and, uh, and they are, their talents are welcome uh, as part of the way in which the Ottomans just sort of assess who, who can do what to help us. Think again of the way in which the Mongols would go when they would pick out particular groups, you know, artisanal categories and so on. Come along, join us, right? Uh, so so the, the, what's going on in Eastern Europe under Islamic auspices is, is rather different from what's going on in this horror that is the wars of religion in, in Europe. Meantime, conquest of the high seas is happening, right? So that's the story that we switch to. So when we're, so when we're doing the European narrative, we go, wars of religion, uh, well, it did happen. Yeah, it's sort of embarrassing. We don't really want to talk about it, but hey, it made us great, sort of, kind of. Um, in the meantime, what we did do is we conquered the world. Um, and yeah, so question. You, you left us not being able to conquer India. Right, all right, so thank you for that. <laughs> so moving along now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so moving along now, folks. So so um, the you just look at these dates here and you'll see that, that the way in which, so all of these are major, major imperial um, uh, presences and they last into the 20th century in many cases, right? And, and so the, the moral of the story of the, of the spread of gunpowder weapons into the high seas and so on is a very limited one. We have to stand back and go, okay, so what actually happened here? Did the Portuguese conquer India? No. Did they conquer China? No. Did they conquer Southeast Asia? No. They conquered little bits and pieces here and there. They conquered cities. They conquered islands. But they did not take anything serious. So political or politically organized societies now had the depths of a millennium and more of working with gunpowder weapons or working in a Turkic sort of larger larger framework. Who are the who are the the, the Mughals? The Mughals are well, I scratch a Mughal, find a Mongol, right? So so it's a sort of a slightly garbled version of Mongol. They see themselves or some members of the family see themselves as descendants of Tamerlane, who of course thought he was a, a Mongol. And some people even believed it. So maybe it was true. So, the, so, yeah, sorry. So how do you explain then where the Portuguese failed in India? How do you then explain the ability of the British in the mid 18th century to actually take over India? All right, so, all right, so by and by, and by pie in the sky. All right, so let's let's just take it slowly. So, so, so the, so the, the, the British don't, the British and the French don't actually come on the scene until the 17th century, yeah, right, and so so until that time, um, the Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish, they're all just around the edges, right? The British come and they insert themselves into a game that is already up and running. It's a game about who is going, what is going to replace the Mughal state, right? So the Mughal state is being crumbled, bits and pieces of it are sort of falling off. Already, different European groups are choosing up sides. So the French go into parts of southern India, and they say, hey, guys, you heard of Louis XIV? You know what that means? Gunpowder weapons. Dude, we know how to do this, right? And so so they, so they um, later on, they get to say the same thing about Napoleon. But um, by that time, it's too late. Napoleon was on his way to India, some people think, when he got so rudely interrupted in Egypt. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's another whole story. But mm -hmm. so the but it's a but the continuity is that the British and the French and the Dutch, to a degree, choose up sides, uh, and they they find different Muslim rulers that they will back. The British are established in Bengal and in Calcutta. Cal these a lot of these cities are cities that either didn't pre-exist the British or, or come into major new fortunes as the British come in and decide that these are the right place 
to be. So Bombay and Madras being two other ones of that kind. All right, so, um, so the, the British get themselves set up so they become business agents on behalf of the Mughal state, particularly on the lands that are in, in Bengal. And so it's, they begin to acquire, not as political agents, but as business agents, control over territories, relationships to locals, et cetera, that will later stand them in good stead. The French are, the French are doing somewhat similar. The Indians are looking for um, European talent to put into their bureaucracies to get them the energized. Right, now, the, the part that is now dangling, which I need to rush onto because otherwise we have to keep you over time, has to do with the problem of paying for stuff, right? And th that doesn't go away, right? And that's a, that is a theme that, you know, more historical theme that one could take and project, you know, forward quite a ways. All right, so the basic problem is not only can the Portuguese not pay for their empire, except with gold maybe that they can get from Mozambique. So they do get, actually get gold from Mozambique that they use to do some of the, that job. But otherwise, the Spanish are doing it with the silver that they get from the Americas, which they take across the Pacific to Manila, something called the Manila Galleons, which you may or may not have ever heard of. I certainly never did until I started doing world history. And that has popped up as a really important thing because that's the way you get into the Chinese market. The market you want to be in, folks, is the Chinese market, right? And so, and how do you get into the Chinese market? You pay cash on the barrel head. No cash, you're, you're, you're not going to buy any Chinese products. So the Chinese are selling silks, they're selling all kinds of high-end things. Um, European consumers are very interested in them, um, but they can't have them unless the Europeans have a way of paying for them. The British have the same problem. So the British are unable to buy Chinese goods. They can, they can, they can buy Indian goods because they've inserted themselves into the Indian game, but they can't buy Chinese goods. And annoyingly, what is, what is, it, what is the thing that the British are having a problem with? They got a tea monkey on their back. So the spread of tea, the diffusion of tea and coffee goes together with cocoa and sugar. So everybody suddenly got something to drink in the morning, regardless of where they are. So that all happens in the 17th and 18th centuries. So, so the, the tea problem is a really serious problem. And, and the tea, where does this tea come from? So the, the British are sending scouts here, there, and the other place. They, it's coming from China. We got to get into the Chinese market. We got to buy Chinese tea. Oh, but there's a problem. How are we going to do that? So they can milk the Indian market and the entry. In, in, the intra Europe, in the um, um, Southeast Asian market for some profits that they can use for that, but it's not anything like what the size of the market is in, in Britain. So they do need a, a solution. Ah, there is a solution. Who knows what that solution is? Opium. Opium, opium right. So the opium story is because, because the, Euro the Europeans have got, or the British have got a tea monkey on their back. They want to put an opium monkey on the backs of China, right? That's the way it spreads. That's running it by awfully fast, but I realize. But it's but it basically that's one way you can think about what happens in that. So that begins the crumbling of China, right? And crumbling of China had other things driving it. That's not the only thing by any means, but it certainly it certainly contributes in important ways to to all of it. So back again to what we're looking at, and then I'll say goodbye. And that is that has to do with the persistence of these post-Mongol steppe empires, right? So they persist on up into the 20th century in some cases. The Mughal Empire uh, gets taken over by the British, but in many ways what the British do is similar to what the Mughals did. They keep the Mo Mo Mughal, Mughal label uh, and they take over princely states and add those on and don't put them under the Mughals, but otherwise that's similar. The Russian Empire, pretty much the same. The con a lot of what's going on in the 18th century, early 19th century, in the case of, of Russia, is the conquest of the of the steppe areas of the Caucasus, um, of the of the Crimea, et cetera, pushing back in in time or to earlier periods. Um, um, all right, so that's so that's what we see. So and and so so the 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 larger the largest conclusion then is that. The, the military revolution is, is a, not a European thing. Europeans contribute in important ways, primarily by using, um, putting, military, putting artillery on ships, 
and not so much by their ability to do stuff on land. Pause, last point. So I have a friend who teaches at the University of uh, Arizona who is a, an Indianist. Um, and uh, he did an amazing uh, article for the Journal of World History oh, about six or eight years ago, um, in which he, he, he sort of likes to go tramping in the Deccan. The Deccan is the inner plateau on the western side of India. So he and a buddy would go and spend summer vacation going around, going to hilltop forts, just checking them out. So it's just a little hobby, right? He's an historian and he's a cultural historian. He's not a military historian, but he keeps finding these hilltop forts. And he begins to take an interest in the technology. And then he begins to line that technology up with Portuguese technology and Portuguese cannon versus, and, uh, versus Ottoman cannon. Ottoman cannon go to, uh, are, are adopted by the Mughals. Right, so the Ottomans, the Ottomans have an ability to project their, their gunpowder weapons into, into East Africa and as far away as um, the northern tip of Sumatra. Right? So the Ottoman Navy is present. It's absent from the game. You start talking about the Portuguese, it's as if the Ottomans were not there. Right? So it, but they were there, and they were allies of the, of the Muslim powers of, the, of, of India, specifically and particularly the Mughals. Right. And so, um, and the, uh, and the, you know, Europeans were trying to ally themselves with Hindus as we move toward into the 16th century and thereafter. Technology, technology is blind. So people go in, they see Portuguese made this update on their thing. Well, we have these Ottoman cannon. Maybe we can install that update in, the, in our cannon. So then the Portuguese have a, a run of good luck. They conquer some places. They, they bring back some, port, some, um, some Indian cannon, and they look at those and they go, oh, that's kind of interesting. Look at what they just did. Maybe we can get our Portuguese cannon to do that. So you've got a world pe passing of the, of the, of, of the, of the, of the gunpowder components of, um, um, the gun, of the military revolution. Right? So this is, this, is the, the, this is the actual sort of smoking, literally smoking gun. <laughs> that puts it all together so that they're actually looking at one another as these technologies are being transferred back and forth. Nobody is saying steal from these guys. Like, oh, no, they're evil. We couldn't steal from them. Their stuff is horrible. We wouldn't want it. They don't say that. They say, gun's a gun. Let's just check, check it out. All right. So, so the, tool, the, the toolkit approach, I guess is what I'm, where I'm headed towards, the toolkit approach then is a, is a very fertile one for being able to unpack a lot of the things that we have absorbed in the previous ways in which we've told the world historical story and, and accounts for a lot of discrepancies th that were not previously uh, put in play, like the persistence of these post-Mongol step empires. So next year, as we say, we will go forward in September. And if any of you want to come back, bring friends, uh, it's, it's, I would be delighted. I'm going to continue on with this. Um, and if you have ideas, uh, I'd love to know them. Uh, it is getting to 12 o'clock. If you do have questions, I realize a lot of people are on time schedules. Uh, if you need to leave, please do. If you want to ask a question or two, um, now is your chance. Yeah. I didn't uh, follow the point of when you're starting a thread about the hilltop forts. Oh, yeah. And I didn't quite. Oh, well, so it was just that he discovered this transfer technology. That's the, it, that was the basic thing. That, that you, then you start, you know, you're an academic. So then you start reading the, the military history of Portugal, just to say, gunpowder weapons, especially, is richly detailed, right? So you can go and you can go, oh, Portuguese made this little tweak. Oh, but that's an Ottoman tweak, he says. He, Dick Eaton is, the, is my friend. So Richard Eaton at, at Arizona is the man who discovered this. And, and so he, and he can see how this is sort of a, game going on with the Ottomans and the, and the Portuguese via the Indians and Indians on both sides are making these these tweaks in the technology. And it's just, it's really, it's quite fascinating. And similar kinds of things are happening in, in the rest of East Asia. So there's, there's been a whole new way of thinking about the military revolution in Korea and Japan and China, et cetera, that, that also needs to be put into play that never is, is, component, is part of this larger picture, right? And so, and 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 gunpowder, sorry, get me going else. I I have to stop. So <laughs> questions, sorry, not very good in self discipline. Yes, um, question. All right. Well, thank you. Come back many and strong.